This is going to be my most positive review yet, and because of that I have to say a few things before we start. Firstly, I make videos in the way that I do, never using affiliate links, because not only does that allow me to criticise a product, to speak negatively about something when it's appropriate, but also it means that you can trust me when I'm speaking positively. It means that if I'm speaking positively and giving praise to a product, which there's going to be quite a bit of in this video, it's because I genuinely love that product, not because I'm trying to get traffic to an affiliate link in the description or keep a manufacturer happy. I have no affiliation whatsoever with Hollow Audio or any other audio company for that matter. I paid for this myself. This is a retail unit, this isn't a cherry-picked demo unit. Absolutely all thoughts and opinions are entirely my own. Secondly, this is going to be probably the longest review because this is an extremely flexible product and there's a lot to talk about here, not just in terms of subjective stuff, which if you want to skip straight to the subjective, go to this timestamp and there are full timestamps on the side. There's so much to talk about in terms of the design, and I'm not just going to be reviewing this standalone, I'm also going to be comparing the Level 2 to the Level 3 KTE. As far as I'm aware, no other review's done that yet, so if you want to hear that, stick around. So then, as said, if you want to skip straight to the subjective stuff, then skip to this timestamp, but for now let's talk about the build and the design. The build itself is as solid as you could possibly get. It's huge. It's massive, obviously. This thing weighs about 20 kilograms, or 45 pounds for our non-Earl Grey drinking friends. Do not think that this is just going to sit nicely on a desk. This is a Hi-Fi Man Aria for scale. It's massive. It's absolutely huge. You can separate the DAC and the power supply, Power supply is the bottom unit, and I'll be opening these up in a sec. But it's massive. They are both really, really heavy, 20 kilograms in total, and, and it's enormous. The actual design of the chassis itself is gorgeous. There's this lovely black brushed aluminium uh, top here, and on the front, copper buttons, all copper side panels. It, this is just, it's an absolutely ridiculously solid build, to the point where I was actually told that there was someone who dropped one of these down the stairs, and it worked fine. It retains a really clean aesthetic without going over the top. It's not super simple, but it's definitely still eye-catching, especially with these side panels. The side panels are absolutely stellar, as you can see there. And if you get the KTE model, you get that little Fox logo. If you buy from Wildism and get a level 3 there, then you get that little Wildism logo on the front. And this is the remote. The remote obviously matches the chassis itself. Same copper buttons, and this is milled from a single piece of metal as well. Absolutely lovely, and just super clicky buttons there. The build is absolutely stellar. Outside and in. Let's have a look at the power supply first. This is the power supply, and as you can see, it's pretty gorgeous. Absolutely completely door mono, separated by this massive piece of metal here. Linear, multi-stage regulation. If you get the KTE model, then all this copper wiring is actually replaced with silver wiring. How much difference that makes, I will leave up to you. It's voltage switchable, so if you were, well, if you when you buy it, they set it to the correct voltage for your region. If you were to move to, from the US to the UK or something, you can open it up and switch it yourself. Obviously consult with your dealer before you do that, just to avoid any warranty issues. It's lovely. These transformers, these are not regular toroidal transformers. A regular toroidal transformer looks like this. It's round, as you can see, with flat edges. These are O-type transformers. These are hand-wound, because these cannot be made in an automated process, and these are also flat wire, not round wire. Hollow has done everything they can to constrain the electromagnetic field as tightly as possible. These are more expensive, these are more difficult to make, but they've spared no expense in terms of the components, in terms of the actual design itself. It is gorgeous, all the way through to the actual cable that connects it to the DAC itself. This is the interlink cable. It's pretty thick, but it's pretty uh, flexible as well, so that's lovely. Lovely uh, Limo-style connectors here, and you can see if you just pull that down then that releases the latches. You, I don't know if you can upgrade this cable, uh, ask your dealer for that, but to be honest, I don't think you'd need to. It's it's gorgeous, it feels fantastic, and you're not really going to see it anyway, it's just behind the deck. So the actual power supply itself is gorgeous, I cannot find anything here to say that isn't super positive. Let's have a look at the deck itself. This is the deck itself, and wow is the first thing that comes to mind. This is a gorgeous interior, it's beautifully laid out, the components are amazing, We'll talk about each bit independently. Let's start with the digital input section. So, this is the Hollow Audio Titanus USB implementation. This is a fully proprietary USB implementation. You can actually see the Hollow Audio logo on that chip there. This is great for a few reasons, and you get this if you get the level 2 or level 3 versions of the May. Firstly, the jitter spec is insane. 
This is the jitter that I measured on the May, and that's down at minus 170 dB, other than the really close in stuff, which is probably just limited by my ADC. This is a measurement which L7 Audio Lab took of the Spring 3, which is upcoming. And if you get the level 3 version of that, the KTE model, then you get the same USB implementation as the May. What jitter? There isn't any. It's nuts. Secondly, it's fully galvanically isolated. You can actually see there's a, even a gap in the PCB here. That means that no noise whatsoever can be transferred through from the source. So you can plug this into just a beefy gaming PC or something. No electrical noise can be passed through. That's fantastic. I really wish that was standard on a lot more DACs. Lovely to see. If we look underneath the USB module, we can actually see that there's another isolation transformer there. That is used for isolating some of the other digital inputs. I don't know if there's more transformers underneath. I've not lifted that up. But it's lovely to see that the other digital inputs are also galvanically isolated. This here is the SPDIF and AES receiver chip. And here we have an AKM upsampling chip. So this DAC is intended to be used NOS. That's how it was designed. But if you want to use internal oversampling, you can. And if you do, then that AKM chip is what's doing the upsampling. When it's in NOS, that chip is completely out of the signal path. And also, the I2S and USB inputs support up to PCM 1.536 megahertz, so twice 768 kilohertz, and DSD 1024. So you can use software like HQ Player to do insane levels of oversampling and get better results than something like Accord Dave and M Scaler. The M Scaler is a million taps. Uh, HQ Player's Sync L at 1.536 megahertz is 4 million. So that's pretty fantastic. Here we can see the nice Christic clocks. Let's talk about a PLL. So this DAC has a system called a phase locked loop, and it has the most powerful PLL of any DAC you can currently buy. What is a PLL? It attenuates jitter. So if you have a bad source, this for example is the worst source I have. This is optical output from my just my main PC. This is what happens when you turn the PLL on. It just gets rid of any jitter whatsoever. It has over 80 dB of jitter attenuation. That is insane. So that means that with the PLL on, you can use pretty much any source. It'll be galvanically isolated and any jitter will be attenuated to almost immeasurable levels. That's insane. That's fantastic. Absolutely well done, Jeff Zhu. You've done an amazing job there. So moving to the DAC sections themselves, which are separated by these massive pieces of metal, same as what we saw on the power supply, this is the R2R ladder. Now we've got an FPGA here controlling the R2R ladder. This is not an FPGA DAC. And in fact, there's some confusion about what an FPGA DAC is. An FPGA DAC like Cord or DCS isn't an FPGA DAC. The FPGA isn't doing the output. An FPGA is a field programmable gate array. It's a programmable microprocessor basically. And it is controlling other circuitry which is doing the output. In the case of Cord, the FPGA is controlling the pulse array. In the case of DCS, the FPGA is controlling the ring DAC. On hollow, the FPGA is controlling the R2R ladder. Now, we've got a couple things here. There's the main R2R ladder, which is fully balanced, fully differential, and hollow has achieved insane measured performance, especially for an R2R DAC, but also just for a DAC generally. Top of the line Delta Sigma DACs like the Mola Mola Tembaki, for example, that gets, I think, 125 dB of true dynamic range. The May gets 140, 140, that's nuts. That's absolutely insane. And the Synad as measured by L7 Audio Lab was 118 dB, and that was with 3 dB of volume control added. So at its max output of 5.8 volts, it's probably around 121, or could be anyway. Hollow has managed to get insane performance on this stack. How have they done that? Well, it's thanks to what they call their linear compensation technology. Jeff Zhu doesn't want to say too much about this because obviously it's a bit of their secret source. I mean, the, the results speak for themselves in terms of how well it's doing. But what I have been told, every single component is measured. Every single transistor, resistor, trace on the board is measured and the electrical properties recorded. And that allows the DAC in real time, not as a pre-configured thing, some, some stuff I'm guessing is being measured on the fly, to be corrected for. And seemingly, given the measured performance of this DAC, it's doing that bloody well. They said that actually they could get away using this technology with using much lower tolerance resistors, but they don't feel that would be appropriate because why wouldn't you go overboard if you're able to, like they've done with everything else here apparently. What I love about the May is it represents a perfectionist and over-the-top approach to engineering. 
everything that could be done well or be done good has been done exceptionally. And even things that most people wouldn't ever think to look at or think to even check or haven't been done before, they've done because they want to, because they want to have the best possible everything. Everything from just fully galvanically isolating everything, completely proprietary USB implementation, the best PLL in any DAC that you can get, the linear compensation stuff, and perhaps the biggest example, the biggest problem with most R2R DACs is you can't play DSD natively on them, because DSD is one bit, and you can't play one bit information on a traditional R2R ladder, which is 16 or 24 bit or 20 bit or whatever. Rockner DACs, for example, they convert DSD to 768 kHz, 24 bit PCM, and play it on the main ladder. Denifrip stacks, they convert it to a very high sample rate 6 bit PCM, and play it on the main ladder. Hollow made another DAC. This is not an R2R ladder. This is a fully discrete, true 1 bit native DSD converter. When you play DSD on this, which another example of over the top stuff, 768 kHz and DSD 512 wasn't enough, so they made it so that you can do PCM 1.536 MHz and DSD 1024, so ridiculously high sample rate. When you play DSD, it doesn't use the PCM ladder, it uses a separate DAC. This is not just an R2R DAC, this is an R2R and a Delta Sigma DAC, both of which perform exceptionally, both of which sound beautiful, and the fact that that, who would think about that? Who would think to check that? None of the competitors are doing it, it's not something which they people have been asking for, what, it's, they just did it because they could, because they thought, this isn't good enough. Resampling to PCM, even at a high sample rate, it sounds great, yeah, but it's not good enough, we want to do it the best we possibly can. That approach is fantastic, and I, it's the complete opposite of cutting corners, it's doing everything ridiculously over the top. So, true 24-bit R2R ladder with linear compensation, and a true 1-bit native DSD converter. Awesome. Let's move to the analog output stage. So this is a fully discrete, fully class A output stage. This runs hot. This is a DAC which pulls about 50 watts from the wall at idle, which is more than most speaker amps. I think my HP2 pulls about 25 watts. It, this is a big, heavy, hot DAC. So again, it's not going to sit super nicely on a lot of desks, but it's worth it. Also worth mentioning, these capacitors are power filtering. These are not in the signal path. So don't worry about this being capacitor coupled or anything, it is direct coupled, these are just for power filtering. And also obviously you can see that there's an RCA and an XLR output. Absolutely nothing here that I can say other than really positive stuff. Their approach to engineering, their approach to doing everything over the top is wonderful. Even stuff which people would never think to look at. This is two DAX, because... Uh, anyway, let's take a look at the I.O. So. On the back we have AC input, DC output from the power supply, and input to the main unit. On the interconnect there is a little red dot which just indicates where the top is, you just line that up, push it in, clicks nicely like that, and then if you want to remove it you just pull it out. Really nice connectors there. Unbalanced and balanced outputs, and then on the digital input section there is coax SPDIF, BNC SPDIF, which you can use these interchangeably because they're actually the same thing, just different connectors, so just get an adapter. AES, optical, USB, and then two I2S ports. Now, what Hollow's done here is another example of kind of going the extra mile. They did not use an LVDS chipset like most DACs do. They created their own proprietary circuit for I2S, and that has two main benefits. Firstly, they say that it increases the jitter spec because they keep the lines completely separate. There's no ICs or anything involved. It's completely separate all the way through to the actual DACs themselves. And secondly, the problem is I2S, even though almost everything is now moved to using HDMI as a standard in terms of the connector, there's some exceptions, like there's that Hi-Fi Rose streamer which uses a DVI connector for some reason. The problem is that the pinout isn't the same, and so you can end up with like a Gustard DAC and something which uses the PS Audio uh, layout on the source, and they won't work together. There's a lot of devices which don't have the same pinout even though they use an HDMI connector. And so what Hollow has done with their proprietary circuit is you can change it. You literally just program what pinout you want. You can even have these two be completely separate. So you can have one DDC with one layout and then a streamer with another layout. These two set to different things and it'll work perfectly with both. So a completely configurable pinout as well. That is fantastic. Now, before we get onto the subjective impressions, let's quickly look at the front one more time. So, this is the front of the unit. This is the key to E1. I've actually got the level 2 down there. It's turned off because I was just showing you the insides. I have spent quite a bit of time comparing these two. I uh, had them both connected to the Serene, just flipping back and forth, spending a bit of time with both. 
there are some differences, and I'll talk about that in a bit. For now though, everything else I'm going to say in this review is applicable to both, because these are so similar. The differences are incredibly minor, but I'll get into that later. If you buy a level 3, a Kitsune 2 edition from Kitsune, then you get this CNC milled Fox logo on the top. If you buy one from Wildism, you get this Wildism Audio logo on the front. Otherwise on the front, there is the nice copper power button, obviously a big display, which you can turn off with this button there. A mute button. Now this does actually turn off the Class A output stages, but it doesn't really save much power because this DAC temperature regulates, it keeps itself at the optimum temperature, and so even with those turned off, it'll keep certain circuitry on in order to keep it at the optimum temperature, which means it doesn't really save much power. So just treat that as an actual mute button, not standby. Oversampling. Now this goes either OS, which is PCM to PCM and DSD to DSD, or you can go everything to PCM, everything to DSD, or non-oversampling, NOS, which is how it's intended to be used. Source then obviously just cycles through everything. Now, one thing is that with the PLL turned on, there is some locking time. So whenever you first select a source like that, or when there is a change in sample rate, as you saw there, there'll be a few seconds of locking time. Sometimes that'll be two or three seconds like it was then. Sometimes it'll be 10 seconds. It kind of depends on the song. There's not actually a delay in the audio. So you can still play games and stuff on this. It's not like there's actually a buffer. It's just that there will be a delay before it actually kind of starts letting audio through as such. So, if, and if that bothers you, you can turn the PLL off. So it's not a massive problem. I would recommend keeping it on though for any kind of music use. And also if you use USB, there's no locking time. So if the locking time bothers you, then use a USB source. As I mentioned earlier, the USB implementation in the May is stellar, so you're not losing anything in terms of quality there. Right, now let's talk about how this thing sounds. Sorry, no subjective feedback just yet. Because the May review was getting really long, I decided to split it into two parts to make it a little bit more digestible. Part 1 was obviously talking about the design and internals of the DAC, and Part 2 will be talking about my subjective impressions and comparisons. Part 2 is available on Patreon now, and it will be on YouTube a few days after this is posted. If you want to support me on Patreon, you get early access, access to the private chat, and all funding in Patreon is going towards acquiring an audio precision analyzer to make in-depth content. A huge thank you to all of my supporters, especially my Diamond and Legend tier supporters, Chris, CK Yozizawa Zhu, Daniel Mellinger, Jidan the Shiba, Lossless British Accent, Ross Kyle, Woland, Gravitas, Naivode Su, Bean Boawito, Daniel Hybiak, Jeremy Zagorski, King Jong Un, Commodus, Lana Bennett, Ledeje, Luxifer, and Pokey. You guys are fantastic. Thank you so much. And to everyone else, see you in part two.